Chapter 8. The Drivers and Firemen. It would be impossible to remember every good or bad experience that I'd encountered during my firing days. However, I'll do my best to give you an idea about the various characters that existed within the footplate staff at Guildford at that time. Alex McClymont, who was a fireman, past fireman, in my firing days, had the good sense to save a copy of the seniority list of drivers and firemen at Guildford Motor Power Depot, which had been posted in the notice case in 1964. The list of names total 86 drivers and 73 firemen, but of course some of the drivers and firemen that I'd met when I started my firing career in 1962 had already retired, passed away or moved to other depots. Drivers such as Charlie Lyford, Bill Boxall, Jack Bixley, Jim Farley, Ernie Riggs, Bill Hedgecock, Jazz Taylor, Joe Hawkins, Bill Souton, to name just a few. Out of the list of drivers, there are only a small number that I didn't have the pleasure of being booked with, but they still stand out in my memory as being real characters of their time. The most senior driver on this 1964 list was Jim Kemble, who entered railway service in 1914 and became a registered driver in 1938. One notable turn that I worked with Jim was with the Drummond M7 tank 30055. We had to work some empty coaching stock, a 12 car set from Waterloo to Oakland sidings situated near Weybridge and Walton, where quite a lot of empty coaching stock was berthed during the summer months. In order to be the correct way round to position the train within the sidings, the train had to be worked by Twickenham, Staines and Weybridge, so that when we reached Walton on the up local line, we were in the correct position to propel the train back into Oakland sidings. I'd worked a train in excess of this weight before, but only to Clapham Junction, so this was quite an experience for me. We managed to get to Walton without any problems, and afterwards we worked the locomotive back light to Guildford. Archie, Mr Gaff Archie joined the railway in March 1915 and was appointed driver in 1940. Unfortunately, I didn't have the pleasure of firing to Mr Gaff, but he was quite a character. Always carried a bottle of cold tea with him in a whiskey bottle. Arthur Cobbett Arthur joined the railway in 1915 and was appointed driver in 1941 and was the father of three sons, Cecil, Brian and Alan, who were all firemen at Guildford Motor Power Depot. I fired to Arthur on quite a number of occasions, reading the Red Hill passenger work and freight trains to Feltham and was very easy to get along with. Jack Blackman Jack also entered railway service in 1915 and was appointed driver in 1941. I fired to Jack quite a few times. He was always great fun to be with. He was always playing practical jokes and was a very popular driver with the younger firemen. He was also willing to give you a hand with preparation and disposal duties. Jack is pictured here with his regular farm at that time, Jeff Sumner, at Aldershot Yard. Jim Emmings Jim joined the railway in 1916 and was appointed driver in 1942. It was always a joy to be booked along with Jim, as he was such a jovial character. If we had to travel passenger anywhere in the single compartment of a train, he told you to start scratching yourself so that any passengers wanting to join you in the compartment would think better of it. Another of Jim's great sayings, especially when we were nearing Hampton Court Junction, was Don't talk to me now, we're in the London area. I had some excellent times with Jim and was sad to see him retire. A true gentleman and a great engineman. Bill Taylor Bill also joined the railway in 1916 and was appointed driver in 1942. My only recollection of firing to Bill was on Boxing Day 1963. We signed on and worked a passenger train from Guildford to Reading Southern Station and after turning the locomotive at Reading Motive Power Depot, worked another train back to Red Hill and then returned to Guildford. We were booked a U-class locomotive and all the way over to Reading, Bill kept adjusting the amount of oil that was being fed to the cylinders by adjusting the sight feed valves provided on the hydrostatic lubricator. There were two sight feeds that you could view to count the amount of drips of oil that were being fed to the cylinders and it was customary that the farmer would close the associated oil feed and water feed valves at the end of each journey so the oil wasn't wasted. 
Unfortunately, I made a mistake and closed the sight feed valves instead, and Bill gave me a right reprimand, as it had taken him ages to get them set just right. Well, we all learn from our mistakes. George Boone. George, seen here driving a 1550 horsepower Crompton, became my regular driver when I moved into the top link, replacing his regular fireman, Alan Gaff. George wasn't at his most talkative on early turns, but we got along very well. He was an excellent engine, and we had some really good trips. However, I wasn't with him very long, as he was nearing retirement. Reg Howard. Reg started his railway career in 1916 and was appointed driver in 1942. I've already mentioned Reg as being the first top link driver that I'd fired to within the firing days apprenticeship section and I was booked with Reg on many other occasions. During the middle 1960s, Guildford drivers had to learn the Western mechanical units as Guildford Motive Power Depot still had rostered work to Basingstoke and Salisbury. As Reg didn't own a car, he said that it was more difficult for him to learn the traction, as it involved changing gears. This photo shows Reg on his last day of work, Good Friday, 4th of April 1966, working the diverted Bournemouth Bell with rebuilt West Country Class 34093 Saunton. His fireman that day was Roger Hope. Horace Cummins. Horace was one of the drivers in the table gang, and in the time that I knew him, he was restricted to shunting duties within the depot. This photo shows Horace on B4 Class 30089 at Guildford Shed in 1961. Reg Beer. Originally from the West Country, Reg joined the railway in 1916 and was appointed driver in 1943. Reg became my regular driver in the old man's gang, replacing Charlie Lyford when he retired. Reg would also fairly often be called upon to be acting running foreman. Wherever we went, Reg would always find something to take home. J.W. Jim Parker Jim joined the railway in 1918 and was appointed driver in 1946. He was a restricted driver in the table gang when I started work and I was his fireman on several occasions. He also had two sons, Ken and Jim, working at Guildford Motor Power Depot, and in later years Jim was able to return to driving on the main line. Arthur Tom Reeks Tom joined the railway in February 1917 and was appointed driver in March 1943. Unfortunately, I didn't get chance to fire to Tom, but can remember him quite clearly while sitting around the table in the driver's cabin talking of his early experiences as a fireman and driver. A kind, likeable man, he'd have us all us young firemen enthralled with his tales. Sid Splinter Wood Sid joined the railway in February 1916 and was appointed driver in April 1942. I fired a Sid on quite a number of occasions and on one of them we nearly came to grief at Red Hill Motive Power Depot. As mentioned before, you usually entered the depot via the Brighton main line towards Earlswood, reversing back into the depot via the turntable. As we were nearing the turntable, I could see that Sid was miles away, and in the end I had to shout to him that we were nearly there. All of a sudden, Sid came out of his trance and dropped the handle, but we went straight across the turntable and didn't stop until we'd reached the other side. It was a good job the turntable had been set, or we would have ended up off the road. Ben Boyce. Ben joined the railway in February 1917 and was appointed driver in March 1943. He was a real gentleman and a treat to work with. His overalls were always spotlessly clean except for one day when we were getting a BR Standard Class 5MT locomotive ready at Basingstoke to work the 1212 passenger service to Woking. In order to get the fire ready I opened the blower just as Ben was oiling round the front end of the locomotive. A jet of dirty water shot out of the blower ring, which surrounds the blast pipe to the smoke box, out the chimney and came down on Ben like a shower of dirty rain. As you can imagine, Ben wasn't amused, as his normally immaculately clean overalls were splattered with sooty spots, giving the appearance similar to a Dalmatian. Percy Petheridge Percy joined the railway in 1917 and was appointed driver in 1944. 
I fired to Percy on a number of occasions and he always came across to me as being a very dignified person and a pillar of society. He was also a prominent member of the St John's Ambulance Association was always championing their cause. Some of the other men at the depot joked that he was the Mayor of Borden as he came from Whitehill and on performing some research for this book found that his 19 year old son Lance Corporal Kenneth John Petheridge lost his life with so many other brave men in Operation Market Garden at Arnhem the same year as his father was appointed driver. Like so many other drivers that lost their sons in the Second World War, they never spoke about their loss. Ernie Minton Ernie joined the railway in 1918 and was appointed driver in 1944. Ernie was quite a character and I fired to him a number of times. He always had some really good stories to tell you and usually you couldn't get a word in once he started telling them. Some would jokingly say that he'd been given an injection with a gramophone needle. There weren't many occasions when you would see Ernie without him wearing his overcoat and it was a joke at the time that Ernie had to go into hospital every summer for an operation to have his overcoat removed. Charlie Churchill Charlie joined the railway in 1917 and was appointed driver in 1944. Charlie was very short in stature, probably no more than five feet tall and on summer locomotives he could hardly see out of the windows. I fired to Charlie quite a few times and one day we were working a passenger train from Guildford to Red Hill. As we reached the top of the bank at Welsham Bridge and hurtled down towards Dorking with the U-Class locomotive rocking and rolling all over the place, I looked across at this diminutive figure that was reaching up for the brake handle and wondered how on earth he could see where we were going. Frank Tickner Frank joined the railway in 1918 and was appointed driver in 1944. I didn't fire to Frank, but remember him as a jovial character and he'd always be singing a tune which sounded something like rom pom pom you always knew when frank was nearby as he liked to chew cloves of garlic bert reed bert joined the railway in 1918 and was appointed driver in 1944 i can't ever recall firing to bert but i was his second man on several occasions when guildford drivers learnt the 1550 horsepower type 3 crompton and type JAJB electro diesel locomotives. Percy Smallbones. What a character Percy was. He started on the railway in July 1918 and became a driver in February 1946, a month before I was born. Percy was a restricted driver in the table gang when I joined the railway and was probably restricted to the shed because of hearing loss. He was an absolute ace at the art of gurning and made some fantastic expressions by removing his false teeth. He used to have us in fits of laughter. Charlie Boskett Charlie joined the railway in 1918 and was appointed driver in 1944. Charlie was a bit of a character and would always walk around with his chest bare, whatever the weather. I fired to him a number of times and even if we were travelling tender first, He'd braved the elements and when we reached our destination his chest would be a dark crimson colour. Even when he rode his moped to work he'd be the same except that he wore a crash helmet and big motorcycle gauntlets. Charlie also carried a small leather pouch around his waist which contained Boar's sweets and he would reward you with one if you had a good trip. When he retired he became the resident gravedigger at Ash Church. Bill Soul. Bill joined the railway in 1918 and was appointed driver in 1945. Bill was keen on sea fishing and one of his fishermen's tales was about a huge conger eel that he caught and the subsequent problems encountered once he'd landed it in a small boat that they were in. I fired to Bill a number of times and can remember quite vividly one of the trips we had. I hadn't been firing very long and the first part of the duty involved working a freight from Guildford to Feltham with an S15 class locomotive. We then turned the locomotive at Feltham and ran tender first to Waterloo in order to work the 7.2pm van train to Woking. Bill was anxious that we shouldn't get in the way of the following train and said we'd have to clear Hampton Court Junction within 18 minutes. We started away and it wasn't long before Bill put the regulator in a double valve, something I'd never seen before. Bill still remained anxious, making sure that I was doing my job properly and keeping the pressure gauge well over towards the red line. 
After we had reached Hampton Court Junction within the prescribed time, Bill looked at his watch and you could see his mood change and his expression relax. Ted Fry Ted joined the railway in 1919 and was appointed driver in 1948. I fired to Ted on a number of occasions with no problems as far as I can remember. His only habit was that he would quite often ask what your thoughts were regarding fellow workmates and I was always cautious regarding my replies. Dick Skinner Dick also joined the railway in 1917 and was appointed driver in 1944. I fired to Dick on quite a number of occasions and we got along very well. Dick was a keen lover of snuff and he'd always offer you a pinch of it from his snuff box. He also had quite a squeaky voice, probably caused by the amount of snuff he used to take. When we were on an early Salisbury passenger turn, after the disposal of the locomotive, he'd always go down to the butcher's shop in the market square and return with some faggots. Alfie Springle Alfie joined the railway in 1918 and was appointed driver in 1946, four months after I was born. Alfie was a shed engineman and I don't know how long he'd been restricted from the main line. I was only booked with him a couple of times as shed engineman's mate along with other members of the table gang. My memory of Alfie is that whilst moving a locomotive he would apply the brakes climb down the steps and jump off long before the locomotive had come to rest. Frank Maidment Frank joined the railway in 1919 and was appointed driver in 1948. I fired to Frank several times, usually trips over the Reading to Red Hill line, which were the bread and butter work for Guildford men. I was also his second man on a number of occasions on various trips with 1550 horsepower Cromptons, and Class JAJB type electro diesel locomotives. Jim Luff. Jim joined the railway in 1919 and was appointed driver in 1948. I was booked with Jim several times in my firing career and we had some good trips as far as I can recall. Another thing I can remember about him was he always smoked a bulldog pipe. Ted Greaseherd. Ted joined the railway in 1937 and was appointed driver in 1952. I fired to Ted quite a number of times, and later on in my railway career, in 1987, I joined him at Waterloo Training Centre as a fellow instructor. Ted loved reading Mickey Spillane novels, and when we'd be working on a ballast train at night, he'd read the whole book with a gauge lamp as his only light source. One bank holiday in 1964, we worked a double trip from Guildford to Horsham in return with a Q1 class. Unfortunately, I can't remember its number. Ted Harper Ted joined the railway in 1940 and was appointed driver in 1957. I was only Ted's fireman a couple of times, once on a trip from Guildford to Felton and a trip over the Guildford to Horsham line. This photo shows Ted and his fireman Peter Butter eating a sandwich at Guildford aboard Ivert Class 2MT 41301 in 1965. Peter Nixon. Peter joined the railway in 1940 and was appointed driver in 1957. I can't recall ever firing to Peter but do remember that he liked to work the night ballast turns as there were a lot of overtime to be made at that time. He earned himself the nickname of Mr Moneybags. Bill Phillips. Bill joined the railway in 1940 and was appointed driver in 1958. As previously mentioned in the Cleaning Days chapter, I went on a trip to Reading and back to Guildford with Bill and his fireman Jim Granger, which was my first trip out onto the main line beyond Guildford. Bill was a very likeable, quiet and unassuming man and unfortunately I didn't get to fire to him. He's pictured here driving a Waterloo to Reading stopping service at Wokingham. Eric Clark. Eric joined the railway in August 1940 and became a driver in June 1958. I fired to Eric a number of times and he was great fun to be with. I remember we were working a pickup freight from Woking Yard to Basingstoke one day and when we called in to drop off some wagons at Fleet Yard on the down there were a number of cars parked there that were too near to the sidings. 
I can remember that a couple of bumpers of the cars were damaged by the wagons as we passed them. Eric moved to Woking EMU depot before steam finished in July 1967. George Nurse George joined the railway in July 1940 and became a driver in July 1957. I don't remember firing to George, but do remember that he was a bit of a practical joker and would throw his voice, imitating a ventriloquist. George moved to Guildford EMU depot before steam finished in 1967. Fred Warner Fred, or Pat as he was commonly known, joined the railway in 1941 and was appointed driver in 1958. I fired to Pat on quite a number of occasions and I always enjoyed his company. Brian Davy, Brian, nicknamed Brush because of his moustache, joined the railway in December 1946 and became a driver in July 1958. I didn't fire to Brian, but remember that he was always immaculately dressed. He also moved to Guildford EMU depot before steam finished in 1967. Derek Hayter. Derek joined the railway in 1947 and was appointed driver in 1959. I fired to Derek for a whole week when he was covering Charlie Lifer's turn whilst he was on holiday. The turn involved short trips out and about the Guildford area, coal trains to London Road Station and freight to Shalford Goodshed. It was a great week as Derek was very encouraging, giving me lots of pointers on how to perform different tasks. He would also ask you searching questions about different lineside features and their meaning. He taught me a great deal on how to become a good fireman. Don Ottignan. Don joined the railway in 1947 and was appointed driver in 1959. I only fired to Don once on the early paper train from Guildford to Portsmouth. He also ran the mutual improvement classes and helped a lot of firemen learn to pass their driving examinations. In later years I worked with Don at both at Waterloo and Basingstoke training centres and ironically briefly worked with both of his daughters when I worked for Surrey Police. Alan Ackhurst. Alan joined the railway in 1947 and was appointed driver in 1960. I was Alan's regular fireman in number two link for 18 months and more can be read about Alan and his exploits in the firing days up through the links chapter. Stanley Harms. Stan joined the railway in 1947 and was appointed driver in 1960. Stan became my regular driver in the top link and we had some great times together. I've written more about Stan in the Foreign Days top link chapter devoted to that time between 1966 and 1967. Dennis Copus. Dennis joined the railway in 1947 and was appointed driver in 1960. I fired to Dennis quite a number of times and it was always a pleasure to be in his company. Always smiling with a fantastic sense of humour, he would have you in stitches with his anecdotes. If you looked on the alteration sheet the day before and noted that you were booked with Dennis, you went home with the thought that you couldn't wait to get the work the next day. We would always talk about how awful the game shows on TV were at that time. Double Your Money, hosted by Huey Green, and Take Your Pick, hosted by Michael Miles. And we both agreed that they should have been given concrete overcoats. One trip whilst firing to Dennis springs to mind. I'd stupidly taken a coronation anniversary mug to work with me instead of an ordinary one. We were working a freight train from Woking to Basingstoke with an S15 class and because the locomotive didn't have the best of riding qualities, the vibration of the engine against the tender made the mug fall off the box on the tender and break into several pieces. Another lesson learnt the hard way. The photograph shows Dennis Copus on the right with driver Jack Bixley on M7 class 30324 at Woking Carriage Sidings in 1952. Although I knew Jack Bixley, I personally didn't have the pleasure to fire to him as he retired in 1963. The next photograph shows Dennis on rebuilt Merchant Navy class 35008 Orient Line at Andover in 1967. Dennis Tack. Dennis joined the railway in 1947 and was appointed driver in 1960. I fired to Dennis quite a number of times, which was always enjoyable. 
we shared a number of interests, especially photography. Dennis was a very keen photographer and I learned a lot from him. One day when working over the Reading line with Ray Bartlett, Dennis thought he'd seen some smoke coming from under the door of a plate ladder hut near North Kent Station. On the return journey to Guildford, he found the hut had been burnt to the ground. The only thing remaining was the brick chimney. Fred Ringer Fred joined the railway in 1948 and was appointed driver in 1961. I fired to Fred on a number of occasions. He was always good fun to be with. Always smartly dressed, he can be seen as a young past fireman in an excellent Pathé news film about the Southern Railway children's home at Woking. He appears near the end of the film, showing some children around V Schools Class 30903 Charterhouse at Woking East End Sidings, which was adjacent to the home. Jim Parker Jim started on the railway in 1948 and was appointed driver in 1961. I fired to Jim on a number of occasions and later, as diesel traction was introduced, acted as his second man. Jim's nickname was Number Six as he chain-smoked players number six cigarettes as seen above. He was a very good card player and I'm very grateful that he taught me how to play cribbage. Jock Miles Jock joined the railway in 1948 and was appointed driver in 1961. I fired to Jock quite a number of times and we got on very well. Jock and I are also featured together briefly in Lou Waldridge's 8mm film sequence as we leave Guildford Old Shed and take water on the old pit. Tony Harper Tony was Ted's younger brother and he joined the railway in 1948 and was appointed driver in 1961. I fired to Tony on a number of occasions, mainly when he'd be covering my regular driver's leave. Jim Soule I fired to Jim quite a number of times and in the latter years of steam, Jim let me perform the driving duties on several occasions and he taught me a lot. Whilst doing some research for this book, Jim told me a tale of when he was firing to Jess Hartbury, his regular driver at the time. It was a winter's morning and they were working the 7.33am passenger train from Woking to Southampton Terminus. It was getting near starting time when Jess appeared on the footplate carrying an empty three feet square cardboard box. What are you going to do with that box? asked Jim. I'm going to stand in it, came the reply. Apparently Jess suffered from rheumatism in his legs and standing inside the cardboard box kept the draught out and his legs warm. When they reached the end of their journey at Southampton Terminus, Jess ripped up the box and threw it in the firebox. Apparently this continued all week, with Jess finding a fresh box to stand in every day. Les Wilmot Les, or Wobbler as he was affectionately known, joined the railway in 1948 and was appointed driver in 1961. I had some great times firing to Les. He was a very keen photographer, so we had plenty of things to talk about. Whenever we worked a train to Reading and had time to look around the town, Les and I would trawl the camera shots, looking at the range of telephoto lenses that were displayed in their windows. I couldn't afford to buy any of them then though, not on a fireman's wage. John Carter John joined the railway in 1949 and was appointed driver in 1961. I fired to John several times and we got on very well. He also occasionally performed acting running foreman's duties. I remember taking a call note out to John's house when I was a cleaner and John answered the door without his shirt on. I was confronted with a huge tattoo of a tiger's head that John had emblazoned on his chest. Ray Reed. Ray joined the railway in 1948 and was appointed driver in 1961. I fired to Ray quite a number of times and I'm indebted to Ray for forcing me to be ambidextrous in my firing technique. Most southern region locomotives were set with the driver's position on the left. The only locomotives that I fired to which were right hand were the U class and most of the N class and the western region pannier tanks that worked the MP coaching stock in and out of Waterloo to Clapham Yard. I'm naturally left-handed, so it was easy for me to fire to the left-handed locomotives and stay over my side of the footplate. However, I was booked with Ray for a week as my regular driver, Reg Beer, was performing the acting foreman's role. 
We were booked a duty which had a right-handed U-class locomotive and Ray informed me that I wasn't to step over his side of the footplate but stay over my side. I found it very awkward at first and kept hitting the outside of the firehole door with the shovel, the coal going everywhere but in the place I wanted it to go. Every time I attempted to swap sides, Ray exclaimed, get back over your own side. And although I didn't enjoy it, after a few days my aim got a bit better. On the Saturday morning, we were booked to work a passenger service from Woking to Basingstoke with another right-handed U-class locomotive. And away we went from Woking with Ray really larruping the locomotive. I persevered with firing on my side and eventually we reached Basingstoke without any drawbacks. After that, I didn't have any concerns about which locomotive I worked on and was glad Ray made me persevere with firing right-handed, otherwise I'd never have learned. Jim Wattleworth Jim joined the railway in 1949 and I'm not sure where he was appointed driver as he moved to Guildford from the Fratton Motor Power Depot. I fired to Jim on several occasions and we had a great time together. One day while shunting at Farnborough with Q class 30542, Jim and I noticed that the locomotive of the 12.12pm passenger service from Basingstoke to Waterloo had come to grief in the up local platform. The shunter asked Jim if we could assist and work the train forward to Woking. In the meantime, the locomotive, a standard class 5MT, came off the train and gingerly moved back into the up bay platform. The driver and fireman on the failed locomotive were Frank Tickner and Bill Brain, and Frank explained that he thought that one of the piston valves had broken. We then backed onto the train, coupled up and worked the service as far as Woking. We looked quite a sight hurtling along through Brookwood, tender first with the passenger train, an exciting and eventful day. The following photograph shows Battle of Britain Class 34052 Lord Dowding with feather flying as it heads towards Farncombe with an SCTS Four County Special on the 9th of October 1966 with driver Jim Wattleworth and fireman Ken Earl in charge. An ideal choice for the Guildford roster clerk, as Jim was previously based at Fratton Motive Power Depot and already conversant with the route. Gordon Ballard Gordon joined the railway in 1949 and was appointed driver in 1961. I fired to Gordon on a number of occasions and we had some really good trips. Gordon would also like to tour the shops at Reading and his favourite ruse would be to go into a hi-fi shop such as Bangal Olufsen and act as if he was going to buy some of their top-of-the-range equipment with absolutely no intention of buying anything. The salesman would be rushing around catering for Gordon's every whim and as soon as Gordon had heard enough, he'd then say thanks very much and exit the shop. Douglas Stent Doug joined the railway in 1949 and was appointed driver in 1962. I fired to Doug on several occasions and once after working a train into Godalming Goods and completed the shunting, we had a cup of tea in the shunter's cabin and on returning to the locomotive, we couldn't see in the cab for steam. When Doug eventually managed to climb onto the footplate, he found that one of the gauge glasses had burst. Doug managed to close the isolating cocks and we returned to Guildford Motive Power Depot where the shed fitter replaced the gauge glass. Derek Ansell. Derek joined the railway in 1949 and was appointed driver in 1962. I fired to Derek quite a few times and can remember on one occasion when we were working an empty stone train from Woking to Salisbury with a BR Standard Class 4MT locomotive. We had a full load of empty stone offers and although we had plenty of steam, we very nearly didn't make it up the gradient from Andover to Greatly as the locomotive was severely underpowered. Mick Sparrow Mick joined the railway in 1950 and was appointed driver in February 1962. At the same time I was appointed fireman and I was fortunate enough to be booked with Mick as his first regular mate. As mentioned, our time together was limited because of work regulations that were in place at the time. However, the time that I spent in his company was great fun and he taught me a lot. One day we were heading down towards Salisbury and just before we got to the watercress beds at Hurstbourne, Mick exclaimed over the thunder of the locomotive's exhaust, when Alan Ackhurst came down here last, he caught the watercress beds alight. 
I was completely naive at that time and replied, did he? Mick still remembers the occasion. Ray Bridger. Ray joined the railway in 1950 and was also appointed driver in 1962. I fired to Ray quite a number of times and he was very easy going and good company. Ray was also the person to see if you wanted your push bike mended. Ray Beeson. Ray joined the railway in 1950 and was appointed driver in 1962. I can't recall ever firing to Ray, but was his second man on a number of occasions after he'd learnt diesel traction. Ray would also occasionally perform acting running foreman's duties. John Berriman. John joined the railway in 1951 and was appointed driver in 1962. I can't remember firing to John at any time on a steam locomotive, but can remember an incident when a Type JB electro diesel locomotive that he was moving off the turntable onto the new pit suddenly lurched and the trailing bogey of the locomotive derailed. Someone, who will remain nameless, had forgotten to utilise the securing pin at the end opposite the controls of the turntable, and as a rear bogey approached the rail joint, the turntable slewed round, causing the rear bogey wheels to become derailed. John would also occasionally perform acting running former's duties and was in this role on the last day of steam on Sunday the 9th of July 1967. Victor Pratt Vic joined the railway in 1952 and was appointed driver in 1962. One of the turns that we had on an ad hoc basis was to work a freight train from Nine Elms Yard to Guildford and this particular evening, because of engineering works, we were diverted via the new line via Cobham. Vic lived in a semi-detached railway cottage on the Guildford side of London Road Station, the garden of the house adjoining the down railway line. We had a BR Standard Class 4MT locomotive and during the journey, Vic asked me to find as many large lumps of coal that were on the tender and stack them on the rubbing plate between the tender and the locomotive. As we passed Vic's house, he slowed the train down to a walking pace and as we passed by his house, we rolled the lumps off the side into his garden. It wasn't until the morning and in daylight that Vic realised that some of the boulders of coal that we'd jettisoned had demolished his children's rocking horse. Bernie Gray Bernie joined the railway in 1951 and was appointed driver in 1962. I fired to Bernie on a number of occasions and he was great fun to be with. Bernie was a member of the Magic Circle and was forever performing card tricks. He was the first person I'd known to have a photographic memory, so it was quite an adversary when it came to playing cards or chess against him. Bernie was also a keen fisherman, as I was, and we would try to outdo each other with fishermen's tails. After Bernie learnt the Type JAJB electro diesel traction, I was his second man on a freight from Aldershot Yard to Guildford. As we left Aldershot Yard, Bernie decided to change over from diesel to electric power before we reached the third rail, and as there wasn't a ramp attached to the third rail, when the shoes lowered, they collided with the inside of the third rail. There was a big shower of sparks, so Bernie applied the brakes and we came to a stand. On examination, we found that one of the shoes had broken away from the shoe beam, but was still attached to the shoe lead. Bernie decided to return back into Aldershot Yard to clear the main line, with me walking along beside the locomotive holding the shoe clear of the ground with a hook switch pole. Pat Evans Pat joined the railway in 1952 and was appointed driver in 1962. I fired to Pat quite a number of times and we got along very well. At that time, Pat lived at Applegarth Avenue, Park Barn, and when we were booked together on an early turn, I used to give him a lift to work on my motorcycle. He was as strong as an ox, and once he picked Charlie Hampshire up and hung him by his belt on the vacuum dummy of a locomotive. All Charlie could do was hang there by his own weight and cry for help. Arthur Stretfield Arthur joined the railway in 1952 and was appointed driver in 1963. I was booked as Arthur's fireman a number of times and we got along very well. He was a great engine man and we had some really good trips. Lou Waldridge. Lou joined the railway in 1952 and was appointed driver in 1963. I fired to Lou a number of times and he was great fun to be with. 
Lou also had the presence of mind to record a lot of steam working in the 1960s with an 8mm camera. Most of the photographs that accompany each driver's profile in this chapter are frames from the films that he made at that time, and I would have been lost without them. The next couple of photographs show Lou Waldridge and his fireman Ray Bartlett working an RCTS and Woking Homes rail tour on the 18th of June 1967. The train ran from Waterloo to Fareham via Horsley, Guildford and Havant with BR Standard Class 5MT 73029 double-headed with original West Country Class 34023 Blackmore Vale. Peter Bunce Peter joined the railway in 1952 and was appointed driver in 1963. As mentioned in an earlier chapter, Peter helped me prepare my locomotive on my very first firing turn. We were booked together on a number of other occasions and one trip sticks out in my mind quite vividly. One evening we had to go past the Southampton Old Docks and work a boat train from there to Waterloo via Havant. I'm not sure how we got to the docks, but do remember that the rebuilt West Country Class locomotive was already on the train and was standing under the canopy of the ocean terminal. Although the fire had been made up to a certain degree, I was unable to do anything until the moment of departure, as the locomotive was standing within the terminal building. Had I tried to build up the fire, this would have caused a lot of smoke to be emitted and caused absolute havoc. As soon as we left, I roused the fire with the dark, but for some reason the locomotive didn't respond. It was completely dark by this time, and I didn't have a clue about the route we were taking via Netley, but once we got to Haven, I knew where I was. The locomotive wasn't steaming well at all, and as we went up the bank towards Bereton Tunnel, the boiler pressure gauge dropped right back to 160 psi. Luckily, we managed to reach the summit, and Peter eased the regulator, and I managed to recoup some water in the boiler. We descended to Petersfield, but still had the next climb from List to Hazemi to condemn with. I'm happy to say that we didn't have to stop for a blow-up, but was glad to get to Guildford and regain some more steam pressure when we took water at the London end of number three up Cobham platform. It wasn't one of the best trips I'd had with a boat train. Bill Edwards. Bill joined the railway in 1953 at Eastleigh and took up his appointment as a driver at Guildford in 1963. I was Bill's fireman on a number of occasions and his theory when working a locomotive was to pull a lever up tight as soon as possible and let the locomotive work on expansion. I'm not sure whether this worked on some of the locomotives we had at Guildford as most of the drivers that I worked with had quite a different approach. Don Bannerman Don started on the railway in 1953 and was appointed driver in 1963. I fired to Don quite a few times and we got along quite well. Don was a bit of a prankster and one day whilst cleaning the fire on a Q1 class locomotive at Farnham Down Yard, a strong smell of ammonia suddenly filled the cab. I looked out the cab window to find that Don had decided to take a leak right where I was throwing out the clinker, hence the awful pong. Another turn when we were booked together was to take a Drury 204 horsepower diesel shunter light to Eastleigh and return with a replacement back to Guildford. The maximum speed for a Drury shunter was 20 mile an hour, so we were quite often put away in different locations to let other trains pass us by. The Drury shunter had a watering can on board as part of its equipment, and as it was a really hot summer's day, and Don being the prankster, he thought it would be a great idea to water some of the plate layer staff as we passed by them. There was a lot of shaking of fists from some, I can tell you. On our return to Guildford with the replacement locomotive, Don found an old cracked railway cup on the desk and decided to throw it out on the open window. As he did so, the cup accidentally caught the edge of the sliding glass panel. The window shattered into hundreds of tiny pieces and we ended up having to brush all the bits out of the door. I'm not sure whether he mentioned the broken window to the fitters either, so I don't know if it was noticed by anyone else or not. Sissel Cobbett. Sissel joined the railway in 1953 and was appointed driver in 1963. I fired to Sissel, or Crunch as he was affectionately known, on several occasions and he was great to be with. Even though Sissel lived in Farncom, when we were booked together on an early turn, I'd pick him up and give him a lift to work on my motorcycle. I think that the most exciting trip I had with him was a double boat train. 
We caught the fast train from Guildford to Waterloo and luckily the train inadvertently stopped at Vauxhall, so that saved us some time in getting to Nine Elms Motive Power Depot. We were booked a BR Standard Class 5MT locomotive and after preparation we ran light to Waterloo to join our train. We had an excellent trip down to Southampton Old Docks and had a couple of hours to kill before working the train back. Sissel helped me get the coal forward and take water and I then prepared the fire for our return trip. We then both decided to take some liquid refreshment ourselves at a local pub before working the train back to Waterloo. Gilbert Austin Gilbert joined the railway in 1953 and was a past farmer when I first fired to him. It was also the first time that I'd been booked on Guildford Motor Power Depot's prestigious 6-9pm turn and I was quite looking forward to it. The turn involved going past the Woking and relieved the 12-12pm ex Bailingstoke stopping service which ran fast to Waterloo. We had a signal check at Rains Park which delayed us for a couple of minutes but we still managed to reach our destination on time. It was the first time that I'd been at real speed on a BR standard class and was amazed at how well the locomotive rode. After the train was removed at Waterloo, we ran light to Nine Elms where we took coal and water and turned the locomotive for our return trip. At around 5.20pm we took the locomotive back light to Waterloo and coupled to our train in platform 11. We departed Waterloo with the 6.9pm dead on time and had a really good trip back to Woking where we were relieved by another Guildford crew. Ted Lewis Ted or Lou as he'd like to be called joined the railway in 1953 and was a past fireman when I had my first trip with him from Waterloo to Southampton. The story is featured in the Firing Days Apprenticeship section. Tony Shannon Tony joined the railway in 1954 and was also a past fireman when I was booked with him. Tony was a very likeable man and we got along very well. On preparation and disposal duties, Tony would always give you a hand with the chores. David Elston Dave, or Bert as he was sometimes called, joined the railway in 1955 and was a past fireman at the depot. I fired to him on a number of occasions and we had some really good times together. One notable trip was to work an engineering train from Woking Yard to Eastleigh with a rebuilt Merchant Navy Class 35008 Orient Line. When we reached Worting Junction, we were held there at signals to allow another train to pass and a photographer appeared by the line side and started taking photographs. I asked him if he would kindly send me a copy of the prints, which he kindly did, and these are the photographs that he sent me. Edward Ted Wells Ted joined the railway in 1955 and was a past fireman during my time at Guildford. I fired to Ted a number of times and for some reason or other, can only remember a turn that we seemed to get quite frequently which involved the working of a van train from Hazemere to Guildford. Quite often the train would be headed by a West Country or Battle of Britain class locomotive and once we'd detached the vans at Guildford the locomotive would have to be turned via the Addison Junction Weybridge Triangle as the turntable at Guildford wasn't large enough to accommodate their size. The next two photographs show the author aboard original West Country class 34002 Salisbury departing Guildford to turn the locomotive at Addleston Junction Weybridge Triangle. I'm just about to take a photograph of Ray Bartlett and didn't know until later that Ray had also taken a photograph of me at the same time. The second photograph of course shows Ray Bartlett aboard U-Class 31791 at Guildford Station. Ray's train of empty coal wagons has just returned from London Road Station Yard with the coal empties. Terry Butwell. Terry joined the railway in 1955 and transferred to Guildford from Bricklayer's Arms. I fired to Terry quite a number of times without any mishaps as far as I can remember. Len Boxall. Len joined the railway in 1955 and was a past fireman whenever I was booked as his fireman. I had some great times with Len and after working any train finishing at Basingstoke, we always seemed to end up in the railway club for a swift pint before returning to Guildford. It was also general practice to have a gamble on the fruit machines whilst there. 
The fruit machine had a golden head motive at the top of it, and Len would always give it a couple of rubs with his sleeve to bring us luck before playing. I can't say that it worked every time, but we normally came away a couple of quid up. Aldershot was a very busy place in the early 1960s, and Len and I were shunting in the main yard with U-Class 31800, originally K-Class tank A800 named River Cray. I learnt this because I'd been reading a book called Red for Danger, and A800 had derailed just outside Pole Hill Tunnel, Sevenoaks, in 1927. I mentioned this to Len as we were shunting, and as we were hauling some wagons out of the shed road, Tender First, under the guidance of shunter Bill Paget, to continue up to the shunting neck, we collided with a 1550 horsepower Crompton and stationary van train that was standing foul in the shunting road. As we hit the side of the Crompton, a huge plume of liquid shot into the air. At the time, I thought it was a diesel tank had split. Luckily, it was water we'd seen. As upon collision, the bogey frame of the Crompton had punched a hole in the bottom corner of the locomotive's tender. Thankfully, no one was hurt, but it upset the cribbage match that was being played by the crew, driver Jim Waterworth and his farmer Brian Pickett, in the cab of the Crompton at the time. Jim exclaimed that it had messed his dozen up. In order to return to Guildford, Len had to call for the attendance of a fitter from Guildford Motor Power Depot, and John Daly duly arrived to temporarily fix the leak by plugging the hole with a block of wood. Len thought, as I'd mentioned the fact that the locomotive had been in a crash before, I'd released some sort of jinx. On the 18th of October 1964, Len was the fireman on an RCTS LCGB rail tour special working from Woking to Christ Hospital via Peasmarsh Junction with USA Class 30064. This class of locomotive only had a small coal bunker, so as a precaution, two large bags of coal were also stowed on the footplate. Len informs me that the firebox was also filled completely before they travelled light engine to Woking to pick up their seven coach train. This had travelled down from Waterloo via Ascot and Sturt Lane East Curve with S15 class 30839 in charge. Off they went and apparently after leaving Woking heading towards Guildford, the engine and train's top speed was recorded at 37 mile an hour. On reaching Baynard's for a photographic stop, all of the coal in the bunker has now been used and Len had already broken into one of the sacks of coal on the footplate. On reaching Cross Hospital and with only one bag of coal left, Driver Fred Warner gingerly nursed the locomotive light engine back to Guildford and by the time they reached Peasmarsh Junction, the fire was completely extinguished. However, they just managed to make it through the two tunnels and into the loco with only a gasp of steam left in the boiler. Jeff Cook Jeff joined the railway in April 1955 and was appointed fireman in July 1958. He was a keen motorcyclist, owning a Norton Dominator. Jeff was Jim Emmings' fireman when I first met him, and a photograph of them both is featured in the Firing Days Apprenticeship chapter. Jeff became a driver at Ascot EMU depot prior to the end of steam. Alan Sammy Rowe Alan, or Sammy as he was nearly always known, joined the railway in April 1956 and was appointed fireman in June 1959. He was a great character and told fantastic tales about his firing exploits and drivers he'd been with. Sammy decided to take a driver's position at Effingham Junction before the end of steam and I joined him there as a newly appointed driver in 1972. Alan Hughes Alan joined the railway in April 1956 and was appointed fireman in July 1959. Alan moved to Nine Elms Depot in 1966 to become a driver and then moved to Aldershot EMU Depot. Jerry Hamlin Jerry joined the railway in July 1956 and was appointed fireman in July 1959. Jerry was a very likeable character and unfortunately had a terrible stutter. One day Jerry was preparing a Q1 class locomotive standing outside the Shedmaster's office and the smoke from the fire was rolling out of the chimney like a huge thundercloud. Rumour has it that Shedmaster George Stovold, whom as mentioned also had a stutter, put his head out of the window and said, Whoa, 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 what, what's all the, the, this smoke? To which Jerry replied, Yeah, yeah, yes, governor. 
It's enough to bloom, bloom, bloom and choke you. Jerry became a driver at Hounslow EMU depot before steam ended in 1967. Alan Gaff. Alan joined the railway in 1956 and was a past fireman whenever I was booked as his fireman. Alan was a bit of a lad and let's say someone you didn't argue with. The only firing turn that I had with him that stands out in my mind was a boat train from Waterloo to Southampton Old Docks and was a title train, the Cunada and was made up of all first-class passenger coaches, and I previously detailed this story in the Up Through the Links chapter. However, on entering the Ocean Terminal building, a motorcycle being ridden by a young lad went over the edge of the platform and landed on the track in front of us. Luckily, Alan was able to stop the train in time, and although shaken by the experience, the rider didn't suffer any serious injuries. Alex McClymont Alex, or Mac as he's most often known, joined the railway in 1956 and was also a past farmer when I was booked as his farmer. I fired to him on quite a number of occasions after he passed his driving examination in May 1965 and can remember both of us travelling over to Ascot on the 30th of January of that year to watch Sir Winston Churchill's funeral train pass through on its way to its resting place at Bladen in Oxfordshire. On another occasion, we were booked together one Sunday on a ballast train between Frimley and Frimley Junction. Once the material train we'd worked on site had been positioned, we decided to take a walk along the track to look at the gravel pit alongside the railway line. Alex then laid down a challenge to see who could throw a stone the furthest, and I was amazed at how far he could throw. Apparently he used to hold a school record on throwing a cricket ball the furthest. Brian Cobbett Brian joined the railway in 1956 and was appointed fireman in 1960. His father and two brothers, Cecil and Alan, also worked at Guildford Motor Power Depot. Brian became a driver at Guildford EMU Depot before steam ended in 1967. Brian Ainsley Brian joined the railway in September 1956 and was appointed fireman in May 1960. Brian was Bert Reed's fireman when I first met him and after passing the necessary driving examinations, he became a driver at Nine Elms Motor Power Depot in June 1964. Brian has also written his memoirs about his life as a railwayman, and is called Through the Ranks of the Southern. Bill Simons Bill started on the railway in 1956, and was a fireman when we first met. After he passed out as a driver in 1965, I fired to him on a number of occasions. He was great fun to be with and had a great sense of humour. One of his sayings that still sticks in my mind was that when he'd be reading a newspaper, he would exclaim, Would you believe it? Midget found dead in matchbox. One evening we were booked together and the running foreman, Cyril Tillman, came in and gave us a job to go past to Woking, relieve a crew and work a special freight to Eastleigh, dispose of the locomotive and come home past. Bill and I thought about how we were going to get back from Woking to Guildford in the early hours of the morning, and it was decided that I should ride my motorcycle to Woking and leave it there. We then planned to catch the last train back to Woking, and then disappear home from there on my motorcycle instead of catching the first train from Woking to Guildford the following morning. The plan was hatched, and I rode my motorcycle to Woking and met Bill on the platform at Woking Station in readiness to relieve the Feltham crew. We worked the train to Eastleigh, and when we took the locomotive into the depot for disposal, the running foreman came out and said that we had to take another locomotive back to Guildford. This spoiled our plans somewhat, as this meant that my motorcycle would be left stranded at Woking. Don't worry, says Bill. When we get to Woking, you ride your motorbike back to Guildford, and I'll take the locomotive back to Guildford on my own. When we reach Woking, I retrieved my motorcycle and left it exactly the same time as Bill did. And as I was going underneath the railway bridge at Britain's Pond, Bill came over the top of the bridge. I rode around the back way to Guildford via the cathedral and the chase, and when I reached the top of the entrance to the road leading down to the motorcycle shed, in order to avoid detection, I turned the engine off on my motorcycle and coasted to a stop. As this was taking place, Bill was just coming out of the tunnel and from the back road I noticed that Cyril Tillman was standing under Farnham Road Bridge watching the movement. I stealthily crept along the walkway adjoining the coal sage 
and managed to rejoin Bill without being seen. Although Cyril didn't say anything to us, I'm sure that he knew what was going on. This incredible piece of film, captured by Lou Waldridge on a frosty winter's morning at Woking Down Bay, shows Bill Simons preparing a cooked breakfast in the traditional way by using the firing shovel as a frying pan. The shovel, of course, would have been cleaned off beforehand with boiling water from the boiler via the pet pipe. You can almost smell the aroma of the cooked breakfast as Bill fries the ingredients. George Mickey. George joined the railway on the 31st of December 1956 and was a fireman when we first met. On one occasion after he passed for driving we were booked together to work the 6 9 p.m. turn. Upon reaching Waterloo with the light engine from Nine Elms and after attaching to the train George asked me if I didn't mind if Alex McClymont could perform the firing duties on the down trip to Woking. I didn't mind at all as it gave me the opportunity to see an ace fireman at work. I can only say that he lived up to his reputation. John Ashby. John joined the railway in 1957 and was a past fireman when I was booked with him. I can only remember one occasion and that was on the 6 9 p.m. Waterloo Woking turn with a BR Standard Class 5 MT locomotive. We had a really good trip and ended up at Woking two minutes early. Peter Jack Ward. Jack joined the railway in 1957 and was a past fireman when I was booked with him as a fireman. Jack was a brilliant ornithologist and for that matter knew a lot about nature in general. Always jovial and great to work with, Jack moved to Woking and became a driver there after steam finished in 1967. Pat Kinsella Pat joined the railway in April 1957 and was appointed fireman in November 1960. My first association with Pat was when I was a cleaner and helping him prepare his locomotive. The consequences are written in the cleaning days chapter. After that incident we became firm friends and we've seen each other socially from then on. Pat passed for driving in 1965 and one trip we had together was quite memorable. We were booked to work a stone train from Woking Yard to Hazelmere, BR Standard Class 5MT 73029. Our train consisted of 12 walrus hoppers, 40 tons laden, plus a brake van. The load up Hazelmere Bank for a BR Standard Class 5MT locomotive was 480 tons, equal to 48, and all went well until we reached the sharp incline between Whitley and Hazelmere. As we climbed the bank, our speed got slower and slower, and although Pat had the regulator wide open and the valve gear at 75% cut off, we eventually came to a stand without slipping just before the substation. As we did so, the safety valve blew, so it wasn't because we were short of steam. There was only one thing for it, and that was to ask the signalman for assistance, and the guard went back to protect the train. It wasn't long before the next stopping service came up behind us and assisted us over the top of the bank into Hazemere. Bill Brain. Bill also joined the railway in 1957 and I fired to him on several occasions whilst he was a past fireman before the end of steam. Bill was a confirmed bachelor and one of those people that lived life to the full. He loved his curry, beer, smoking, his roll-ups and the ladies and the hotter the better, the curry that is. He was also a keen golfer and won quite a few awards and trophies when playing for the railway team. One notable trip I had with Bill was with a boat train from Waterloo to Southampton Docks. 
We caught the train to Waterloo and made our way to Nine Elms Motor Power Depot in the usual manner via Vauxhall and a walk to the depot via the Wandsworth Road. Upon arrival, we were told that our locomotive was to be utilised for another service, as the locomotive that was originally booked on the turn had a mechanical fault. Instead, we were given a BR Standard Class 4MT, as that was the only locomotive available. Somewhat crestfallen, we prepared the locomotive as best as we could, and after taking water, left Nine Elms Motive Power Depot to run light to Waterloo to join our train. After we detached the train of 13 coaches, a traction inspector came up and said he was going to ride down to Southampton Docks with us. This seemed ominous, and after we left Waterloo, I could see why. Although the fire seemed bright enough, the locomotive just didn't want to hold her own, and eventually Bill thought it was best that we stop at Weybridge for a blow-up. After a good 10 minutes, we eventually got going again, but it was quite clear to see that the locomotive's performance was not good enough for express passenger work. We managed to struggle onto Southampton docks and luckily didn't have to stop again. This was the first and only time in my firing career that I'd experienced having to stop for a blow up, but felt that it was certainly not the fault of the crew. Charlie Hampshire. Charlie joined the railway in 1957 and passed his driving examination to become a past fireman in 1965. I fired to Charlie a number of times, mainly on various ballast train workings when the main line from Purbright Junction to Bournemouth was being electrified in 1966. As you can see from Charlie's journal, crews from Guildford worked a lot of overtime during the Bournemouth electrification period prior to the end of steam. Extracts from Charlie's 1966 journals show the date, engine numbers and the fireman's name, myself, Sid Ford and Alec Morton respectively plus a brief resume of the day's duty shown on this and following photographs. Charlie and I had a lot in common, as he was also a keen motorcyclist, and we often used to go for rides out together on days when we weren't working. Charlie was also a dab hand at fixing anything mechanical, and as my motorcycle seemed to suffer from quite a lot of technical problems, I'd often be over at Charlie's place having my bike fettled. It was through Charlie that I met a good friend of his, Bill Scott, and it was he who inspired me to become a better photographer. The first time that I met Bill was when he was climbing down from a BR Standard Class 5MT locomotive at Guildford, as Charlie often used to unofficially take him out on trips. Mick Stokes Mick, seen here with driver Fred Ringer, joined the railway in 1957 and was appointed fireman in July 1961. Mick became a driver at Aldershot EMU depot before steam ended in 1967 and then went on to Farnham depot. John Budd John joined the railway in December 1957 and was appointed fireman in July 1961. John passed his driving exams and was appointed driver at Wimbledon EMU depot in 1964. Fred Garnham Fred joined the railway in 1958 and was a past fireman whenever I was booked with him as a fireman. Fred had an amazing memory and could recall things that had happened in the past in finest detail. However, I don't recall having many firing turns with Fred. Frank Saxby Frank entered railway service in 1959 and was also a past fireman when I was booked with him as a fireman. Frank was and still is passionate about steam locomotives and at that time Part owned a fully restored steamroller. We worked together on several occasions and got along very well. Ken Earl. Ken, or Duke as he liked to be known, joined the railway in 1958 and was also a past fireman when I was booked as his fireman. I will always remember Ken as a kind and considerate man, a gentle giant really, who could brighten anyone's life. Rare qualities these days. He was also a brilliant storyteller with a great sense of humour, and would have us in fits of laughter with his tales when we were either booked together or sitting spare in the mess room. They were great times. Ken was also a keen motorcyclist, so we had lots in common. We sometimes went out on motorcycle rides together, usually at Brands Hatch to watch the top races of the 1960s, including Renzo Pasolini, Phil Reed and Mike the Bike Halewood. One day, Ken was booked a boat train turn with Farman Jeff Ball. This is the poem that Ken wrote afterwards about the trip. 
The Saga of the 820 Boat We left the loo with steam in plenty, I only had her up in twenty. The fire burning oh so bright, the water was up out of sight. The needle was on the mark as we listened to the engine bark. But as we hammer through Vauxhall, the steam in water start to fall. So there we stopped on the main, halting all the other trains. With blower on and needle back, for this I knew we'd get the sack. But soon we were on our way, trying not to cause delay. But now that I'd seen him working, I knew we'd struggle into woking. Another engine we must have. This one now is really bad. So off we come, our heads in sorrow. A ballast engine we must borrow. But do not worry, we all know. You'll probably blame it on the coal. And that she was a flaming dud. The tubes were plastered up with mud. The ash pan full and wanted cleaning. This must have been what stopped her steaming. It wasn't me, the fireman said. I usually keep them in the red. The driver said, I've seen it all. The fireman was the bouncing ball. So this tale must come to an end. No more boats for Guildford men. Ken Earl, 70C, circa 1966. The poem is reproduced with kind permission of Mary Earl and Jeff Ball. Ken was the last person listed on the 1964 seniority sheet that I had the pleasure of working with as a driver on steam locomotives and he transferred to Woking in July 1967. Fellow firemen. Some of the firemen that were working at Guildford when I first started were not listed on the seniority list of Benjamin that was posted in the notice case in 1964. They had either left the railway or had become drivers at other depots. Here are some of them that I can remember. Bill Tickner, Cyril Gardner, Bunny Pilbeam, John Player, Bob Gidley, Clive Ingleton, Neville Weller, John Davidson, Ian Spong and Len Fredericks. Here's another group photograph taken at a reunion at the Bluebell Railway some years ago. From left to right you've got Cyril Gardner, Alex McClymont, Terry Owlsbury, myself, Alan Mansbridge, Bernie Nibbs, Roger Hope, Ray Bartlett and Mick Foster. Jim Granger. Jim moved to Nine Elms Motor Power Depot to fill a driver's position there and I owe Jim a great deal as he was the first person to teach me the fundamentals in firing technique when I accompanied him and driver Bill Phillips to Reading in return when I was an engine cleaner. Georgie Brine. Georgie joined the railway in November 1959 and was appointed fireman in October 1961. Unfortunately, Georgie became seriously ill and passed away in 1965. Ian Barnett. Ian joined the railway in April 1959 and was appointed fireman in October 1961. Ian transferred to Woking when steam ended in July 1967. Dave Hewson. Dave joined the railway in August 1959 and was appointed fireman in November 1961. Dave was more commonly known as Treacle, as he resided at Chobham. Legend has it that just before setting off for the Crimea War, thousands of soldiers that were billeted there buried their Treacle tins, and years later Treacle was seen to be seeping from the ground. Dave was Bill Soul's farming in the top link and moved to Woking at the end of steam in July 1967. Ray Austin Ray joined the railway in August 1959 and was appointed fireman in November 1961. Ray was a very likeable character and like many other firemen at the time came from the Liss area. He always had a smile on his face and was an excellent fireman. Unfortunately Ray left the railway industry before we transferred to Woking in 1967. Brian Pickett Brian joined the railway in 1960 and became a registered fireman in 1962. He was a senior fireman on the seniority list when we transferred to Woking in 1967. Bill Pony Moore. Bill also joined the railway in 1960 and became a registered fireman in 1962. As previously mentioned, I followed in Bill's footsteps in the Boylesmith shop when he became a past cleaner. Whilst a fireman in the old man's gang with driver Bill Hedgecock, Bill Hedgecock gave him the nickname of Pony. Research shows that it was a traditional nickname in the Royal Navy, Royal Marines, 
and was given to anyone with the surname Moore after George Washington's Pony Moore, 1820 to 1909. Pony Moore was a well-known sporting character who allegedly always bet in ponies, betting slang for a sum of £25. Bill's other nickname was Archie, after yet another boxer's name. I still have this vision of Bill wearing a big coat with his work bag round his shoulders, sweating profusely as he cleaned the fire whilst disposing a locomotive up the coal stage. Peter Butter Peter joined the railway in 1960 and became a registered fireman in 1962. I can always remember Peter when he was a cleaner working in the stores with Arthur Legg. Peter didn't stay within the footplate grade for long and left the railway to go into the removal business. John Gardner John joined the railway in 1960 and was appointed fireman in April 1962. As I recall, he was very keen on do-it-yourself and always had a project on the go. John transferred to Woking at the end of steam in July 1967. Alan Cobbett Alan also joined the railway in 1960 and was appointed fireman in April 1962. Alan came from the big railway family. His father Arthur was a driver at Guildford and Alan also had two brothers, Cecil and Brian, that were firemen there at the time. After becoming a past cleaner, he became Ted Wales' regular mate in the Old Man's Gang and then once he was appointed fireman, worked with Bert Reed. Alan transferred to Woking as the second man in July 1967. Terry Aylesbury Terry started on the railway in March 1961 and was appointed fireman in April 1961 at the same time as myself. Terry moved to Feltham Depot to gain his driver's position before steam ended in 1967. Mick Rosewell Mick joined the railway on the 4th of March 1961 and, like myself, was appointed fireman on the 9th of April 1962. When he passed his driving exam, he moved to Dorking EMU Depot. Ian Coles Ian joined the railway in August 1961 and was appointed fireman in May 1962. Ian was a very likeable character and loved fast cars. A couple of memories of Ian spring to mind. On one occasion he was disposing of a locomotive in the back road of the coal stage and completely forgot that a conductor rail existed on the adjoining carriage sidings. As the fire iron touched the conductor rail there was a huge flash but luckily for Ian the charge of electricity found a quicker way to earth via the locomotive's framing. The other incident was in the same vicinity when Ian slipped over whilst walking along the carriage road walkway and landed head first on one of the wooden sleepers. Ian cut his forehead and some of the splinters from the sleeper remained there for the rest of his life. Alan Johns Alan started on the railway in 1961 and was appointed fireman in 1962. Alan's first driver was Bill Hedgecock in the Old Man's Gang and then he progressed through the links with driver Peter Nixon and finally, driver Dennis Copus. Sid Ford. Sid started on the railway in January 1962 and was appointed fireman in August the same year. I've been told by other drivers that Sid was an excellent fireman, which earned him the nickname of Superheat Sid. Alex McClyman even had some spoof business cards made for him, bearing the nickname with the wording Boat Trains a Speciality. Tony Morton. Tony started on the railway in 1962 and also became a fireman in December that year. Tony loved his motorcycles, which earned him the nickname of Rocker. He's featured here in Lou Waldridge's film archive on U-Class 31793 with Lou Waldridge. Tony transferred to Woking when steam ended in 1967. Malcolm Pito Malcolm joined the railway in 1962 and was appointed fireman the same year. Malcolm had a couple of motorcycles whilst he was a fireman at Guildford. The first was an AJS followed by a 500cc Triumph Tiger 100, which he used to let me borrow. It was such a nice motorcycle to ride. I eventually bought one myself in 1967. Richard Bullen Dick joined the railway on the 20th of August 1962 and was appointed fireman on the 10th of March 1963, his birthday. 
Dick's first firing term was with driver Peter Nixon, but then became Derek Ansell's regular fireman. As he progressed through the links, he partnered driver Jock Miles and finally driver John Bannerman. Dick transferred to Woking as a second man in July 1967. Jeff Sumner Jeff joined the railway in 1962 and was appointed fireman in 1963. Jeff rode a Vincent Black Shadow motorcycle as he was quite small in stature and when he was astride it, his feet could only just touch the ground. There's a photo of Jeff on a Q1 class loco in this chapter when he was with his regular driver at the time, Jack Blackman, in the old man's gang. Several other firemen's names that are on the list started work as engine cleaners in 1962 and 1963, but unfortunately I don't have any photos of them. They are John Gray, Dennis Eitley, Dave Deadman, Dave Parfect, Eddie Gulliver, Ray Woodford, Clive Harrison, Malcolm Phillips, Bernie Smith, Brian Bundy, Jeff Groom and Dave Potts. David Newbury Dave joined the railway on the 31st of December 1962 and was appointed fireman on the 2nd December 1963. When David first joined he wasn't the largest of men and earned himself the nickname of Muscles. Dave was fortunate to be one of the firemen that worked the final leg of the LCGB Wellsman Rail Tour, with driver Doug Stent working the train from Horsham to Waterloo via Cranley and Guildford on Sunday the 13th of June 1965. Dave transferred to Woking in July 1967. Alan Mansbridge Alan, or Alfie as he was sometimes known, started on the railway on the 1st of January 1963 and was appointed fireman on the 24th of December the same year. Alan transferred to Woking in July 1967. Robert Hunt Bob joined the railway on the 9th of January 1963 and was appointed fireman on the 27th of January 1964. His first regular mate was Percy Petherbridge in the Old Man's Gang and he then progressed through the links to become Mick Sparrow's fireman in number four link. Bob transferred to Woking as a second man in July 1967. Bernie Nibs Bernie started on the railway as a cleaner on the 6th of August 1963 and was cleaning locomotives at Guildford for about a year before he was appointed as a fireman. On appointment he joined driver Fred Brown in the old man's gang and the following year moved into number two link with driver Les Wilmot until the end of steam. He then transferred to Woking in July 1967. In this photograph, fireman Bernie Nibbs tentatively opens the diesel controller of a JB type 1600 stroke 600 horsepower electro diesel to gradually stretch out the couplings of the loose coupled freight train as he leaves Guildford up yard for Feltham Yard. Once out of the yard and over the conductor rails, electric power would be deployed utilising the electric controller. His driver, Les Wobbler Wilmot, obviously trusting his young farmer's competence in the handling of such a complex locomotive. Roger Hope Roger started on the railway in 1963 and when he passed out as a fireman he was booked along with driver Jack Blackman in the old man's gang. After a while he moved into number two link with driver Jim Wattleworth but finished his railway career soon after steam finished. Ray Bartlett Ray joined the railway on the 12th of August 1963 and was appointed fireman in 1964. His first regular driver was Red Beer in the Old Man's Gang and then became Derek Ansell's regular fireman until the end of steam. Ray transferred to Woking as a second man on the 10th of July 1967 and later, along with myself, we both decided to fill driver's positions at Effingham Junction ZMU depot and transferred there at the same time. Mick Foster Mick joined the railway on the 31st of March 1964 and filled the last appointed fireman's position at Guildford on the 30th of November 1964. Mick's first regular driver was Fred Brown in the Old Man's Gang and then moved up the links to partner Ken Parker and finally Pat Evans. Mick transferred to Woking on the 10th of July 1967. Because steam had finished, Mick decided to apply for a job with the British Transport Police and during this time reached the rank of inspector before retirement. 
His main duties were as a recruitment officer, but he also performed duties on the Royal Train, which was manna from heaven considering his previous railway background. Jeff Ball Jeff joined the railway on the 26th of August 1963, and when he passed for firing, joined driver Ted Wales in the Old Man Gang. He then became Bernie Gray's regular fireman until the end of steam on the 9th of July 1967. Jeff had the honour of being the last person to be booked on duty at Guildford that final day. 22.53 spare. Tom Andrews. Tom joined the railway in August 1963 and worked with a variety of drivers once he'd passed for firing. He remained as a past cleaner at Guildford and transferred to Woking as a second man in July 1967. Malcolm Mac McCabe. Mac started on the railway as an engine cleaner on Monday the 3rd of August 1964 and passed for firing in May 1965. He wasn't appointed as a fireman and remained a past cleaner until the end of steam on the 9th of July 1967. He then transferred to Woking the following day. John Burr. John joined the railway in 1964 and passed for firing the following year. He transferred to Woking as a second man in July 1967. Jim Woods. Jim joined the railway in 1965 and passed for firing the same year. Jim decided to end his railway career before steam ceased in July 1967. When Jim got married, I had the honour of being his best man at his wedding. Traction Inspector Tim Crowley. This chapter wouldn't be complete without mentioning Tim Crowley who was a much respected locomotive inspector during my firing career. Coming up through the ranks himself, Tim had a very understanding outlook regarding the trials and tribulations of footbrake crew. The following photographs show Tim Crowley and Jim Lester, who organised Tim's 80th birthday celebration at the Blue Barrel Railway in 2005. 